Here's four basic types of motion that are described in the textbook. Linear motion, which goes along some straight line. Circular motion. Projectile motion, where an object is flying through the air, affected only by gravity. And rotational motion, where an object might spin around an axis. Motion diagrams. Consider making a movie of a moving object. A movie camera takes photographs at some fixed rate, such as 30 photographs every second, and yet each separate photo is called a frame. If you have a moving object, then it will be at a slightly different position in each frame of a film strip. To make a motion diagram, imagine that you cut the individual frames of the film strip apart and stack them on top of each other so that you can see the multiple frames all at once. This is called a motion diagram. An object with multiple positions or multiple images in a motion diagram is moving. And the same amount of time elapses between each image and the next. Some examples would be an object that has a single position in a motion diagram must be at rest, such as this soccer ball sitting on the ground. An object that has images that are equally spaced would be moving at a constant speed. An object with images that have increasing distance between them must be speeding up, such as a sprinter starting off on a 100 meter dash. An object with images that have decreasing distance between them must be slowing down, such as this car going down, slowing down to a red light. A motion diagram can also show more complex motion. Here is a basketball being tossed up in the air and it goes through this nice parabolic arc until it reaches the hoop. In this case, you can actually see that as the ball is traveling upwards, it's slowing down since these images are getting closer together. And as it goes downwards, it's speeding up again. The particle model. Often, the motion of an object as a whole is not influenced by little details of its size and shape. We only need, need to keep track of a single point and we can treat the object as if all its mass were concentrated into a single point when we're looking at its motion. This is called the particle model. Particles are simple. They have no size, shape, top, bottom, front, or back. We can draw them as a dot. Here is a motion diagram of the car stopping from the previous slide using the particle model. We simply draw these dots and they're getting closer and closer together. To indicate the direction of the motion, We've put labels on the dots to show increasing number is the, is the number of the, fr of the frame. Here's a motion diagram of a rocket launching using the particle model once again. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. As the rocket goes upwards, it's speeding up. In a motion diagram, such as the one shown here, it's useful to add numbers to specify where the object is and when the object was at that position. For example, here's a motion diagram with 0.5 intervals between the frames, and a coordinate system has been added to show x and y. It happens that the frame at t equals 0 is frame 0 when the ball is at the origin. The ball's position in frame 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, can be specified with coordinates x sub 4 equals 12 meters, y sub 4 equals 9 meters, and t sub 4 is 2 seconds. Another way to locate the ball is to draw an arrow from the origin to the point representing the ball. You can then specify the length and direction of the arrow. This is called the position vector, r, with a little arrow on top of the object. Two numbers are required to specify r. One is the length, 15 meters in this case, and the other is the angle as measured counterclockwise from the x-axis, 37 degrees in this case. The position vector is an alternative form of specifying position. It tells us the same thing as the coordinates x and y. It doesn't tell us anything different. To add two vectors, a plus b, first draw a, then place the tail of b at the tip of a, and draw an arrow from the tail of a to the tip of b. This new vector is a plus b. Example, Sam is standing 
50 feet east of the corner of 12th Street and Vine. He then walks northeast for 100 feet to a second point. What is Sam's change of position? Sam's initial position is the vector r sub 0. His final position is the vector r sub 1. Sam has changed his position, and a change in position is called displacement. His displacement is labeled delta r, where this triangle is the Greek letter delta. To define displacement, you need to do a vector subtraction. Delta r is equal to r sub f, the final position, minus r sub i, the initial position. The negative of a vector is the same length as that initial vector, but it points in the opposite direction. With numbers, subtraction is the same as the addition of a negative number. It's similar with vectors. a minus b is defined as a plus negative b. So, for example, to subtract vector b from vector a, first you draw a, then you draw the vector negative b, same as b but opposite direction, and you place the tail of negative b at the tip of a. Then draw an arrow from the tail of a to the tip of negative b. It's the same as adding a plus negative b, and this is the vector a minus b. Just as we considered a change in position, it's useful to consider a change in time. If an object moves from initial position r sub i, at a time t sub i to a final position r sub f at a time t sub f, you can define the time interval as delta t, tf minus ti. Different observers might choose different coordinate systems and different starting times on their clocks. However, all observers find the same values for the displacement delta r and the time interval delta t. To quantify an object's fastness, or slowness, we define a ratio. Average speed is the distance traveled divided by the time interval spent traveling. This doesn't actually include information about the direction of motion, so we define the average velocity of an object to be the vector of the displacement vector divided by the time interval delta t. The velocity vector is in the same direction as the displacement vector. The length of v, with an arrow on top, is directly proportional to the length of delta r. Consequently, we may label the vectors connecting the dots in a motion diagram as velocity vectors, v, these green vectors. So he, below is a motion diagram here for a tortoise racing a hare. The green arrows are average velocity vectors between two individual frames. The length of each arrow represents what the average speed is. Sometimes an object's velocity is constant as it moves, but more often an object changes its velocity as it moves. Acceleration describes a change in velocity. Consider an object whose velocity changes from v1 to v2 during a time inter interval delta t. The quantity delta v is v2 minus v1 is the change in velocity. The rate of change of the velocity is called the average acceleration, delta v divided by delta t. To find the acceleration as the velocity changes from v sub n to v sub n plus 1, you first draw v n plus 1, the second vector, then you draw negative v sub n to subtract v sub n from v sub n plus 1. Then delta v is this difference of two vectors, and delta v is the direction of a. If you want to draw the acceleration vector back in the original motion diagram, just draw a vector at the middle point in the in the direction of delta v and label it a. This is the average acceleration at the midpoint between vn and vn plus 1. Notice that the acceleration vector goes beside the dots, <coughs> not beside the velocity vectors. That's because each acceleration vector is the difference
between two velocity vectors on either side of a dot. When an object is speeding up, the acceleration and velocity vectors point in the same direction. When an object is slowing down, the acceleration and velocity vectors point in opposite directions. An object's velocity is constant if and only if its acceleration is zero. Example is shown in this motion diagram. In A, the object is moving from left to right. The velocity vector points towards the right and is positive. The acceleration vector points towards the right and is positive. This object is speeding up. In motion diagram B, the object is moving from right to left. The velocity vectors point towards the left and the velocity is negative. The acceleration vectors point towards the right and the acceleration is positive, and yet this object is slowing down. Make sure you understand this before we move on. If you have horizontal motion, you can set up an x-axis. Once you set the zero point, the historical tradition is that uh, positions to the right have x positive, positions to the left of zero have x negative. In this case, uh, velocities towards the right have v sub x positive, velocities towards the left have v sub x negative, accelerations towards the right have a sub x positive, and accelerations to the left have a sub x negative. Similarly, for vertical motion, we tend to say that positions above the zero point have y positive and below the zero point have y negative. So in this case, upward velocities have v sub y positive, downward velocities have v sub y negative. Upward acceleration has a sub y positive and downward acceleration has a sub y negative. For example, for free fall acceleration, uh, a sub y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So the sign of the position, x or y, tells us which side of the zero point the object is. The sign of the velocity, v sub x or v sub y, tells us which direction the object is moving. The sign of the acceleration, a sub x or a sub y, simply tells us which direction the acceleration vector points. To find out whether the object is speeding up or slowing down, you compare the direction of the velocity to the direction of the acceleration. Here's a motion diagram made at one frame per minute of a student walking to school. She goes at a constant velocity for a while, seems to slow down, and then to speed up. Another way of representing the student's motion is to make a graph of x versus t. The nice thing here is that for a motion diagram you're only showing the student's position at a particular instance, whereas if you make a plot of x versus t, you can join the dots with a continuous line to show her positions at all instants of time. Physics problems are often presented using words, which can be imprecise or ambiguous, so part of your problem solving involves using symbols and drawings to create a representation which is clear and precise. Some terminology, a verbal representation uses words, a pictorial representation uses diagrams, and a graphical representation uses graphs. A mathematical representation uses equations which you then solve. And all of these are important as you're solving problems. Knight uses a general problem solving strategy in every single example in this textbook. It starts with modeling, then visualize, then solve, and then assess. Please familiarize yourself with these steps. It's not absolutely necessary that you use all these steps every time you solve a problem, but it is important that you have some kind of strategy, and it's important to know that in physics you're expected to work through problems and not just know the answer, and that th there are methods that will get you to the answer. Science is based on experimental measurements, and every measurement requires units. The system of units most often used in science is called Le Système International d'Unité, or SI units. The SI unit of time is the second, which is defined as a certain num the time required for a certain number of oscillations of a cesium atom. This, uh, the SI unit of length is the meter, 
defined by the speed of light, and the SI unit of mass is the kilogram defined as the mass of a particular piece of metal being stored in France. Uh, many lengths, times, and masses are greater or much less than a meter, a second, or a kilogram, so we can use these prefixes, prefixes to denote powers of 10. Giga means 10 to the 9, mega is 10 to the 6 or a million, kilo is 10 to the 3 or a thousand, centi is a hundredth, milli is a thousandth, micro, represented by the Greek letter mu, means a millionth, and nano is a billionth. It's important to be able to convert between different units, and one effective method is to write the conversion factor as a ratio equal to 1, since multiplying by 1 does not change a value. For example, to convert uh, length from feet to meters, you can use the fact that 2.5 centimeters is 1 inch, so this ratio is equal to 1. So you start with 2 feet. Feet is on the top. If you want to cancel the feet, you write a ratio with inches on the top, feet on the bottom, so that the feet units cancel. And you'll get 12 times 2 inches. Then you can multiply by how many centimeters in an inch to cancel the inches, and how many meters in a centimeter to cancel the meters. And you could write 1 over 100 here, or you can write 10 to the 2 over 1. In any case, you end up with 0 0.610 meters is 2 feet. At the final step of this model, visualize, solve, assess step is assess. Make sure that your final answer makes sense. For example, if you're working on a problem about a car and you reach an answer of 35 meters per second, is this a reasonable speed? Well, it's good to keep in mind that a meter per second is about 2 miles per hour. So this car would be moving about 2 times 35 to 70 miles an hour, which is a reasonable highway speed. If you had reached an answer of 300 meter, 350 meters per second for the speed of the car, this would mean it's moving at 700 miles an hour. So either the problem is set up incorrectly, or perhaps you made a calculation error. It's important in science and engineering to state your final answer in the correct number of significant figures. If you say that a length is 6.2, you implicitly are saying that you may have rounded this from anything, any number between 6.15 to 6.25. So you would say 6.2 has two significant figures because the 6 is significant and the 2 is. More precise measurement could give more significant figures, so the appropriate number of significant figures is, de is determined by your data. Calculations follow the weakest link rule. The input value with the smallest number of significant figures determines the number of significant figures used in your final answer. An example of counting significant figures is shown here. 0 0.00620 has three significant figures, which you can see by writing the number in scientific notation. Times 10 to the minus 3 just tells you the order of magnitude, and the 6 and the 2 and the 0 are all considered significant. This trailing zero is significant, whereas these leading zeros are just showing you the decimal place. When using significant figures, keep in mind these three rules. When you're rounding the final answer, and that answer is obtained by multiplying or dividing, the answer should match, the number of significant figures in the answer should match the number of significant figures of the least precisely known number used in the calculation. If you're rounding a final answer which is found from adding or subtracting, the number of decimal places in the answer should match the smallest number of decimal, decimal places used in uh, the calculation. And thirdly, it's important that you shouldn't round off too early. Don't round your intermediate steps, only round your final answer. In many cases, uh, a rough estimate of a number is sufficient. A one significant estimate of a, or, or calculation is called an order of magnitude estimate, and it's denoted by this single squiggly line. And this is a nice little table of some approximate lengths and masses you can look at, such as the distance across a college campus is about 1,000 meters, a small car is about 1,000 kilograms.